the day. And uh, so why don't we just move forward? I did put the uh, website about the, the, we have over 325 podcasts that we did in an eight and a half year time period. And all of those are accessible and free. We have quite a few podcasts uh, on the uh, school education arena, including school bullying. So all of those things are free. Um, it's, it was a community education outreach. And so um, Karen, you and uh, Cindy both have been such a great uh, support and advocate of our podcast show over the years. So let's move right on in. I'm going to do a share screen here and get into the PowerPoint slide. So we have some visuals and there will be uh, opportunity uh, to engage. So let me uh, just get everything situated here. All right, so um, do you see this on the screen, uh, Cindy? I do. Okay, great. So I'm, I'm glad that we could see that. So let me just ask you everyone to uh, type into the chat box. I have two questions because I want to engage with you in different ways. And so the first is what interests you about coaching students, whether they're high school students or even college students, maybe middle school, but what interests you about coaching students? If you'll just type a couple of responses in the chat box, I want to see what you're thinking. And the chat box should be automatically open. Is that right, Cindy? Um, actually, if they'll take their mouse and go to the very bottom, they'll see the chat box and just click on that little call out. I think that's what it's called. And then they'll be able to um, text to everyone. And then you'll see uh, it'll, it'll kind of pipe up. That'll be bright orange. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. So what interests you about coaching students? And in the second question, because uh, you might resonate with the second question even more so, which is what concerns you about coaching students? So either what interests you about coaching students or what concerns you about coaching students? And if you'll uh, type that into the chat box and I can, I believe I'll see that. Okay, so I see one that just came in. Do you see it, Patty? Yes, I think it's uh, from Karen. Coaching students involves empowering students to be self-determined. Thank you, Karen. All right, we'll just give it another minute to give people an opportunity to find their chat box and type that in. <laughs> Okay, now I have the chat box open. So as people uh, come to, okay, very good. So I'm seeing a couple of here. Um, and so some of you will be able to read it. Some of you might not be able to read it. Uh, see, Jorge and Erica lead restorative counselors who work with students and staff at schools. Um, so they're excited about it because they're, they're teaching life skills. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and we want to be able to teach life skills. Uh, and, and certainly coaching is a way to um, educate and raise self-awareness for students. Uh, CD. I apologize if that's not how you actually call your name, but it says CD. <laughs> Interest is in finding new ways to support students I engage with restorative justice. Uh, of course, always definitely a concern of not making things worth uh, work. Um, let's see. It is exactly how my names go. Thank you very much. And Michael, uh, I'm interested because I'm a school social worker in Native communities and we need much empowerment as possible. All right, very, very good. I'm glad you're using some of the words, self-determination and empowerment. Uh, and, and we'll talk about some of the coaching principles. All right, so I'm gonna move on to the next slide then. Let's see if I have luck, I might have to go back out again. So it looks like I have to go back out again, Cindy, just a moment. And let me go back in. All right. So we already know that there's a number of things that uh, uh, teachers or counselors or administrators um, and, uh, and high school or, or uh, college students are already doing when they are seeing students in conflict, maybe they're engaging in students in conflict, or they're observing students in conflict. And obviously there's a number of things that are already happening, these just being some of them. The other that I've heard already, either through the chat or, or just speaking is about the restorative justice practices. I'm glad to see that that is uh, becoming more full scale in the uh, school systems. One of the things though is that 
even when I'm doing conflict coaching right now, pro my primary work uh, in the dispute resolution field has been in the workplace. So it could be federal agencies, universities, uh, sometimes school districts. Um, but oftentimes uh, people will call uh, because they say, well, we have an employee. Now imagine this is a student. We have an employee. We have a student who's in conflict and we need mediation or we need peer mediation. And, and the first thing I always do is assess is mediation appropriate? Is counseling is appropriate? Is it, you know, consulting or expert advice? It's what, what's really appropriate here? Sometimes they call and say, you know what, we need conflict resolution training. Well, tell me more about why you feel conflict resolution training is what you need. Well, we have two individuals who are fighting and they just can't get along. And we just figured instead of addressing them directly, if we just got everybody in the same room and got the same training, that they'd all get it. And it's like, Eh, no, not really. <laughs> Especially if you're dealing with two individuals who are in conflict, let's let's directly address that, whether that's one on one through coaching or through mediation discussion. So part of doing this work is really assessing what is the appropriate intervention strategy is it going to be sending the students to peer mediation is it really peer counseling are we really talking about bullying which is beyond conflict and so we're talking about anti-bullying types of strategies are we really talking about progressive discipline so that would be the first thing i would say before you use any strategy is what is the assessment what is going on in terms of the signs or the patterns patterns of conflict that says this would be more appropriate um, and it could be one or two things that could be appropriate so that would be the first thing I would say is of all the various things that are uh, available to you uh, coaching is going to be one more thing that's an opportunity to add um, but even then sometimes coaching is not appropriate because the person that comes into the coaching may be extremely resistant, may not want to be there. They're very shut down. And of course, really good coaches can off, often deal with resistance and work with a, a student or client and moving past resistance. So that would be the biggest thing is recognizing what the signs and signals are, doing an assessment, a very quick assessment of what would be really the, the appropriate path for this student or students in terms of what we're accessing. Now, moving on to this next slide, because I know, I think everyone I believe who's calling in is probably familiar with the spectrum of conflict resolution, but I know there's a, a number of people who are going to be online, and I don't know where everyone is coming from, so I thought I would just show you a continuum here, and I, I want to get a little highlighter for myself here. So uh, when you look at from the left to the right, in the dispute resolution field, and certainly there's many other uh, processes that are available, what, what we're looking at here is methods of conflict management or resolution. Conflict management is how do I manage the day-to-day -day microaggressions, the day-to-day -day, uh, you know, triggers. Um, it might not necessarily be a resolution, but how do I manage those triggers, those uh, hot buttons for myself? How do I approach or communicate with the individual on day-to-day -day types of things. Conflict resolution is very specific to how do we resolve this ongoing dispute or this situation. And to put it in context, for this conversation today, I'm talking about interpersonal conflict. So a conflict I have with another individual. It could be more than one individual. On the left-hand side, it's very self-directed. So when we think about negotiation in terms of the student world, we're talking about one student talking to the other student directly with no interference. They direct the conversation. And really, it's about how are they approaching it? Can they effectively engage in a simple conversation with the other student? Can they be constructive in how they approach it and not get triggered themselves? So that's where a lot of education comes into play. But where coaching can really help students have those one-to-one -one conversations that could be uncomfortable or even challenging. Uh, certainly mediation, um, a lot of you are very familiar with mediation, peer mediation. There's a real thrust in the 90s. Uh, when I first started getting into the field, peer mediation was just really kind of starting and it was getting super popular. And of course, since then, now we're in 2017, I still hear programs that still exist. Um, 
And I think some of them are very, very vibrant. I love the fact that Cindy has now offered an online virtual opportunity uh, for peer mediation online. And I'm so excited to see that develop uh, with the work that her and, and Karen have been doing on the online peer mediation platform. And of course, mediators, the students themselves are mediating, um, are trained as mediators and are helping other students mediate um, simple and probably even to some more complex kinds of uh, disputes. And then, of course, we have counseling, which, of course, we have peer counseling. You have the school counselors. Uh, and if, as you go to the right, you're going to see less self-determination. And self-determination, you know, you, uh, Karen was bringing that up. And that really simply is honoring the individual's ability to make decisions, to empower them to make decisions. Um, and that decision could be to not do anything. The decision could be to do something. But it also helps them to understand and recognize that there are consequences, positive or negative, to those decisions. So, of course, there's the counseling aspect in the traditional sense of counseling and or even therapy. And as you go to the right, you're talking about really third parties that are resolving uh, conflicts and disputes. Now, in this case, we have arbitration and litigation, but in the student population world, you might be talking about uh, the principal, uh, the juvenile probation system. You're talking about police officers or safety safety officers, uh, those, those individuals are going to be making decisions for the student because the conflict has become much more escalated. So today we're talking about conflict coaching. I often refer to it as conflict management coaching, and we're going to go into, you know, what that is um, next, actually. So let me go to the next slide. And for some reason, it keeps getting stuck. So I'm going to have to end it and get it back in again. All right. So, oops, let me see if I can. All oh, those circles are still there. <laughs> That's funny. Let me see if I can undo them. There we go. That's really strange. Okay, very good. All right. So what is conflict management coaching? Um, first of all, coaching, just like counseling, is a one-on-one -on -one process, and it's often a very structured process. So like peer mediators or mediators have, you know, there's four steps, there's a, a model of flow. Uh, coaching also has a structured process. Coaching is also a goal action and future oriented. So we don't delve way into the past. We might look into the past to get uh, a sampling of what we're talking about, but really the client or the student would come in with a goal. Now they might not know what that goal is and that's part of the coaching is helping them figure out what is it we're trying to do here. And then it's gonna be very future oriented. How do we move forward into the future and also action? This is where they get to be held accountable uh, for the action actions, decisions, and steps that they want to take, empowering them to make the decisions and take the actions uh, that they need to do. It's also about a very big part of coaching is about raising awareness, um, not only about their thinking and their behavior, but about their emotions. So it's about increasing that emotional intelligence. And, you know, students can learn how to be mediators and learn to be mathematicians and all of that. Uh, coaching can really help them with understanding their thinking processes, how their behaviors have consequences, and certainly tying into what it is that they're experiencing in their emotion and how that ties to their body and their body language. Uh, their approach, their tone, all of those things can be uh, taught and learned. Um, and hopefully in the coaching, uh, is, if they're coming in for skills uh, or behavioral changes, the coaching will help them do that as well. And over time, for those who are real interested, building competency and confidence in how they manage uh, interpersonal conflict. So it can be very, uh, it can be a very proactive approach. Now, before we go further into the coaching, I wanted to ask you, and you could use your um, chat box again, what do you think is the difference between coaching and counseling or therapy? What do you think the major differences are between those two approaches? And if you'll just type that into the chat box. Oh, there we go. So I'll, I will type the question in the chat box myself. So is coaching different from counseling? Okay. 
So how do you might think it might be different? Yes, counseling can definitely be more long-term than coaching. What are other thoughts about how counseling or therapy might be different? And certainly one thing, um, yes, the coaching seems, uh, coaching seems to be more strategy oriented, where counseling is more uh, making meaning. Um, coaching is more future oriented with problem solving, less directive. And let's talk a little bit about the less directive. You know, coaching goes back to that empowerment piece. It's not about advising. This is really about empowering and bringing self-awareness from within the student or the client without us giving them awareness. A lot of times we're like, the, the student or the client is telling us their story and as we're coaching them, all of a sudden, uh, you know, an aha goes off for us as the coach. But it's not, it's not our aha to share with the client, it's for us to bring that out of the client with very powerful types of questions so that they don't feel we're leading them down a certain path. Um, the, uh, I think largely it comes back to the goal, action, future focused, um, then exploratory or past focus. And that can be very true. A lot of times counseling will be really delving more deeply into the past. It could involve, especially with students, familial types of patterns or issues. Um, and certainly uh, anything that would be uh, a mental health concern would also be part of the counseling therapy reel. We would not do that as coaches. Um, I, 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 being a licensed clinical social worker, I used to work at the University of Delaware's EAP program for a number of years, and uh, we would have staff come in, and a lot of times we really had to be very clear what hat we were wearing. Uh, it would, on one hand, I could be the clinical social worker and doing therapy for someone, let's say, who had bipolar or had an anxiety disorder um, or depression and they're coming in for that and then all of a sudden they're talking about you know uh, conflict that they're having with their boss and so always had to make it very clear what was I really focused on and uh, and not cross the two paths so that was a boundary uh, that I had to be very careful about and it's almost like a mediator and a coach if you're a neutral as a mediator you want to be neutral to both parties and as a coach you're entering into a partnership with that individual so that would automatically put you out from being the mediator in a case with two individuals. Um, Michael says, you know, yeah, counseling can meander through different areas of person's life uh, and, and very much coaching is very specific and goal oriented. So let me move on into the uh, next slide then to talk about a couple of the operating principles and I'm really having a hard time with forwarding. Okay, there you go. Now these are just three key principles and we're gonna actually have a short discussion uh, in a moment so you'll be able to unmute your phone since we have a small group. Let me go over three of the big three operating principles for coaching. So coaching in the coaching field, International Coach Federation set, has a set of ethical, guiding ethical principles. One is self-determination, much like the dispute resolution field and mediator self-determination, again, is about supporting and empowering that individual to make decisions for themselves and to also realize there are consequences to certain decisions they make or decisions they choose not to make or if this is action oriented and they know, okay, this is the action I need to take, but because of their fear of conflict or conflict avoidance, they choose not to take that action. What is the consequence of not taking that action or postponing that action? Of course, self-awareness is very, very key. Um, coaching is very, uh, is not directive. It is a really allowing and supporting the client uh, through a journey of their self-discovery. Um, we say, especially with clients in general, we'll usually say that the client is the expert of themselves. Now, if you're dealing with students, they're still the expert of themselves based on where they are in their life. If they're 12 years old or 18 years old, they know themselves 
but it's our job as coaches to raise a level of self-awareness through a line of very powerful types of questions to really get them to critically think about the situation, uh, both from their perspective and the other, and that leads to mutuality. So mutuality is a really key principle, uh, especially in conflict coaching, uh, because we're, we are dealing with conflict, we're dealing with another person that we're, we're in the coaching for. So mutuality, when we're, um, coaching the person from their perspective there they know their story inside and out they probably added to their story that, of things that aren't necessarily true but because they've come to believe their story they haven't really challenged themselves to think from the other person's perspective so we use a very structured process to really get them to think outside of themselves and critically think about where this other person they're in conflict with has joined as we call it the not so merry go round of conflict. And oftentimes people have not made the connection that maybe it was something they said or did or didn't say or do weeks before that got that person on the not so merry-go-round, which then led to the event that ended them up in conflict coaching. So a lot of that is looking at what is my contribution to how I got the other person on the not so merry-go-round. So the mutuality is a really, really critical component uh, of coaching. So I'd like to open the uh, phone lines here. And there were, again, um, the first question I want to ask is, if you were to coach a student, which of these principles raises a red flag for you? So let's start with that question first. I'll write the, I'll put the question here. So if you were to coach a student, which of these principles raises a red flag for you? So go ahead and unmute and just whatever comes to mind. Well, this is Michael. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead, Michael. Okay. Sorry, I just got a very long IEP meeting and a little off sounds, but uh, the self-awareness part, I guess, stands out to me because, uh, you know, people often get uh, defensive when, when you try to bring more awareness around the conflict about their own role in getting onto the merry-go-round, or not so merry-go-round, so I think uh, I consider that. Yeah, that defensiveness, and that, and that's not just for, um, you know, the adults that I might coach, but but students in general. What is the concern about the defensiveness for you if you were coaching? Because that would be natural for someone to get defensive. What would be the biggest concern for you about dealing with defensiveness? And for anybody can answer that. Well, for me, I just feel like it snowballs, and then you can kind of, it can, that take on the whole. Thing of its own or something. <laughs> right. And so, and what do you know about defensiveness? Why do people in general get defensive? What are they protecting? Mm, I guess they're, um, I don't know, maybe some sense of equilibrium or, or uh, protecting from shame, maybe, or uh, I don't know. Yeah, so they're protecting something, and that yeah. might come out in the, the coaching. Other thoughts about adding to what Michael is stating about that self-awareness that people get so protective, they're protecting themselves and might get defensive, either even looking at themselves or looking at the other person. So what are, what are other thoughts around that? Patty, this is Cindy. I know with my own students, they like to play the old blame game that it's easier to blame someone else than to actually take responsibility or have accountability because then they have to own up to their own actions, which we often just as human beings don't. <laughs> Mm -hmm, absolutely. They get in that uh, blaming uh, type of place. Exactly. And, and some, sometimes when we get clients who come in already very, very defensive, um, or why am I here? How come the other person's not here? It's their problem, not my problem. Um, then you already know right away that you're dealing with defensiveness, resistance. Um, and, uh, and part of it being a coach is how to begin to build that rapport right off the bat and to let them know you're not there to judge 
judge them. You're not there to blame them. You're there to just help them kind of research, you know, what happened, what, you know, what brought them there because they're going to have a goal, right? And, and when, when you work with the student, they're going to have a goal and part of, you know, Cindy, Cindy learned this in the class and that is a lot of times uh, employees might come in and they might say, uh, well, my goal is just, I wish he'd just get off my back or he'd leave me alone or I wish he wouldn't have to supervise. If the goal was to be about somebody else changing, right? Because they're the bad guy. And I would always let them know, you know, you're in coaching with me. I'm not in coaching with the end of it. And we have no control over changing that person because they're not in coaching. I'm here to support you in what it is you want to do or not do, because obviously the situation is bothering you. So what could I do to support you? What is it you're trying to do that you have control over? And so we're having that conversation first uh, to help them understand what is it that they have control over and not and what what can we do together in reaching that goal so um, any other thank you Michael for bringing up that uh, self-awareness and that defensiveness um, other thoughts about what what which of these principles might ra raise a red flag anything else Now, interestingly, yesterday, um, Cindy and I were talking and uh, we were talking about self-determination and I said, you know, what if a student, you were coaching a student and the a student says, you know what, my decisions, I'm going to go kick his, you know what, okay, let's talk about that. Because it's self-determination is they get to make their own decisions, right? But at the same time, there are boundaries, there are zero tolerance policies, there are things that, that just can't be done, so then there's consequences. So what about coaching might concern you about that self-determination principle? Well, it's me again, Cindy. I, I know with my own students, um, that when we talk about again the accountability part piece um that a lot of a lot of times they are not they just go on emotion and they're not thinking clearly and i'm and i hope that in when i speak to a student that i can give them that time that they can separate and separate from that emotion and think about i mean like go to the the frontal lobe for a moment and think about okay here are the consequences so I think coaching can be really good for that and really helpful because oftentimes students are in that they're in the amygdala and they're not really thinking you know and coaching can really really help with that emotional intelligence piece one helping them to identify what the emotion is that they're experiencing but also what's driving that emotion and one of the things that well, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a coaching model and I'm going to get into the specifics about how this coaching uh, these coaching steps can be very specific to triggers uh, that trigger very strong emotions and what's below those triggers because that's a lot about coaching is really helping to bring that uh, raising that level of emotional intelligence uh, for the student so they can make different choices so all of these all of these principles uh, are are the core operating principles as a number of them are uh, additional ones uh, these are three really big ones uh, that we use as coaches uh, when we're working with clients now let's look at um, the next slide oh there we good good all right so we already talked a little bit about a mediator but I wanted to make sure that you also understood the differences between the mediator and the coach. Now, I'm a mediator, have been for a long time. I started my mediation uh, practice and, and learning mediation back in 1993, 94. And then conflict coaching actually started to enter the United States from Australia back around uh, 2001, 2002. And Cindy Noble out of Canada, who I've been studying under uh, since 2003, and now I'm a competency assessor. I've been doing this for a long time now. Um, she uh, did 
did a lot of research to create a model of practice uh, for conflict coaches. And in 2003 is when I uh, was introduced to her and her model. And I've been um, using conflict coaching, her particular model for years. Uh, and her models used all throughout the world. So it's one of two uh, well-known models um, around the globe. Mediators serve as neutral. And I was a mediator first for years before I became a coach. So we're neutral to the parties. We don't make a decision on their behalf. We don't take sides. Uh, we are there really to uh, be a process expert, to facilitate a process where the two parties are communicating and oftentimes, mediation is about a problem solving process. In other words, we're focused on resolution. Now there obviously are some models uh, like the transform mediation model but that is not, not necessarily problem solving oriented. It's really about the transformation of the relationship. We won't get more into that than that, but most mediation practices are how do we move through this? How do we come to a happy agreement? How do we coexist? How do we come to a resolution? And of course, a mediator's role is to support the communication between the parties. They use a lot of different strategies and reframing and listening and questions. They're making no decisions uh, to the outcome. And of course, they're using uh, strategies to support resolution. And peer mediators are often go through a very similar mediation process when they're learning that in, in terms of how they're working with students. Now, when I became a coach, I had been so ingrained as a mediator that it really took me a while to really transition from what does it mean to be a mediator and what does it mean to be a coach? A lot of times people come into my coaching class and I ask them, you know, why conflict coaching? And they're like, well, I wanted to add a tool to my toolbox. And, you know, I'd listen and I said, so let me just let you know that you're getting a whole new toolbox. You're going to have tools that go from the mediator toolbox kit to the coach. I said, but the coach is a completely different process and you have a very different role. You might use similar tools, but really you're getting a different toolbox. So in the professional coaching field, you're fostering a partnership with that client. You're on a journey together as a researcher, as a partner to get information to help them understand uh, that self-awareness piece, but also to push them to think critically about their role as they're perceived by the other person. We view the client as the expert of themselves. They know themselves, even at 18 years old or 15 years old, they know who they are to some degree from their experiences in life and beliefs. Now, it's not to say that they're necessarily educated about certain conflict resolution strategies or communication, but that could be part of the goal setting. The coach is there to help clarify the client goals, and it's not unusual for clients to come in. All they know is that they're in pain and angst and they don't want to be in conflict anymore, or they are anticipating a conflict. They're so conflict avoidant that whatever is happening in the relationship with another person, the other person doesn't know that they're in conflict with them, but they're in so much angst because they, they can't bring it, bring that, um, uh, confidence to have a difficult conversation and so they'll come into coaching because they just like I need help on even how to approach this person um, it supports client self-discovery you know mediation you're really not doing a lot of that that's not your focus that might occur in caucus uh, private meetings and you're giving um, very little feedback and no advice it, the only the only caveat to feedback is that when you are doing practice skill building practice or they're trying to change a behavior or communicate differently you will be giving feedback but it's not your role to be a consultant uh, when you're in a coach role this is where you're asking lots of really good questions to empower them and to stretch them in that critical thinking and then holding the clients accountable and this is a really, really big element. And I was talking to uh, Cindy yesterday. I said, is that a word that's familiar in the school language? And Cindy said, yes, this is something we talk about all the time, accountability and responsibility. So this is part of the conversation I have with clients is how do I hold you accountable to the action steps you want to take, to the task you want to do to achieve your goal? How do, I, how do you want me to hold you accountable? So it's not like I'm, you know, slapping their hand when they come back the next session and I'm like, did you do your field work? Tsk, 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 you know, it's not that. I'm really there to support them, but I want them to tell me, how do you want me to hold yourself accountable to these changes you're wanting to make? And so it, it, there's buy-in because this is something they've developed for themselves. And of course, you're using strategies to support clients' goals. 
So this is a big distinction uh, between that. So you have resolution oriented for the mediator and you have a very goal action oriented process for the coach. Now on the next slide I wanted to show you um, is thinking about if you were to do coaching. Um, and for that matter, this might be something student coaches do. Think about the ways in which a student might enter conflict coaching as an intervention strategy or even a prevention strategy. So in, our, in my world, we think about conflict as being either before a conflict occurs, you're in the midst of the conflict, or the conflict event has occurred, happened, and it's gone. And so let me just explain briefly each of those. So a student comes to you and says, man, I'm really bothered by my best friend and how she's behaving, and I haven't said anything, and it's really bothering me. So I want to say something, but I don't know how to say it or how to have that conversation. And every time she does it or every time she's doing whatever, I'm getting upset and more and more upset, and I find myself avoiding or, or not being around her or exploding in front of her. And so, um, so the idea is this person is in a lot of angst because they're avoiding it, but they don't know how to approach it, how to deal with it, how to have the conversation. So this would be an example of uh, in your marketing and reaching out to students, we're here for, for you even before conflict occurs to help you be most constructive in approaching that conversation. They're in the middle of a conflict, you know, again, it could be a staff member, a teacher, uh, another student uh, that might be uh, a student they don't know very well, uh, but they're in the middle of it and people know they're in the middle of it, so it's not a secret and so they don't know how to get out of it. So again, coaching can be uh, happening on what are their possibilities, what can they do about this, is it, is it a conversation, is it about behaving differently, is it about avoiding? And avoiding could be an actual strategy as well. So what do they do to stop the not so merry go round spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning? They need to get off. And so the coach can help with that. It could also be after the event, uh, maybe a big blow up happens, uh, again, between themselves and another student. And, but maybe it's had residual impact either on that relationship or the residual impact or consequence is that other people have now um, uh, have gotten upset or in conflict with this individual after the initial event is over with. So how do they mitigate how they deal with kind of the aftermath uh, of that conflict event? And sometimes that could be weeks ago uh, and they're coming to you. So think about the entry points to where conflict coaching uh, can help um, uh, students. Let me just stop there and um, see what questions you have so far. If you want to open your phone or type in a question or comment in the chat box, feel free to do that. So I'll give a few minutes for y'all to unmute if you would like to do so. Anything resonating for anybody? And Cindy, you're still there, right? I am still here. Just make yeah. sure that y'all can actually hear me. <laughs> Patty, I, I'm imagining a situation, this is Karen, imagining a situation that may be going to come to mediation or uh, perhaps a mediation is happening and there needs to be a pause in the middle of the mediation or something. Is it is it conceivable that you could you know, let's say you have a, a full team, wouldn't that be amazing? You have mediators, you have coaches, you have counselors, you know, I mean, you have the full, you know, you fielded an excellent team. Is it possible or has it happened that you could step out of mediation and into some coaching to return back to mediation? Or does that just sound ridiculous? <laughs> no, not at all. And in fact, you raise a good point. Um, think of this also that, uh, let's say the two students are going into mediation, you can offer conflict coaching to each individual prior to the mediation to get them ready for the mediation discussion. That way they're looking at, you know, how do they want to show up in the mediation? What happens if they start to get upset and angry? What do they want to do different? You can help them learn how to control how they want to be 
in that mediation. It could be that during the mediation, uh, now if you had the ideal world and you had coaches uh, on site, uh, in fact, um, one of the mediation clinics that graduate students use at SMU is they actually have coaches on site and if they're doing mediation, and these are usually family divorce types of mediation, so you can imagine people get very emotional and, and upset and they need to take a break. And what, they were, what they've been doing is having coaches um, you know, stand by by, uh, so that if they needed a coach um, before or during or even after the mediation that they were there you know for you know half hour to speak with them now if you are a mediator and you happen to also be trained as a coach you can be coach like during the mediation uh, and or in caucus so I if I'm going into a mediation and I am my primary role as a mediator, I have to be very careful that I don't, I'm not necessarily wearing a coach hat, but I can certainly use my coaching skills to bring and be coach like in uh, like in a caucus. Um, so for example, I had one person, you know, pointing their finger at the other person and blaming and yelling at them. And then you are this and you're all that blaming toxic language. And we have eventually took a caucus and we went into the caucus and I said, so, you know, we opened the caucus as we normally do. What's bothering you? Tell me what's going on. And then I, I simply said, you know, I, I made some observations and, and I'd like to give you some feedback on what I'm seeing and I'm wondering how this might, this conversation could potentially help you when we come back into the mediation. And so I asked for permission first and they said, yeah, of course. And I said, so one of the things that I noticed, no judgment, one of the things I noticed is when I saw, not when you, when I saw the pointing of the finger and your voice was raising, I could see you're getting red, I could see how angry you're getting, and then I'm hearing, you know, you're a racist or whatever the language they're using. What I saw was the other person shutting down and not hearing your message. And I'm wondering, what did you notice when you were doing that? with the other person. And then they were like, well, they weren't hearing me. Um, and I said, so what is important to you to get from this mediation process where they just don't understand me, they're not listening. What could you do differently then? Knowing that what I was observing, and I wonder if you were experiencing it too, is that they were shutting down that kind of, um, you know, when people feel attacked, they feel like they're in a corner and they start to protect themselves, they start to shut down and they're not hearing the message. What do you think you could possibly do different when we go into the main mediation room again so that they can hear your message? And then there's silence and then they silence and then there's a revelation that okay i need to not be pointing my fingers and blah 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 okay so you're angry how do you communicate your anger so they understand what's behind that anger so that's how i'm being coach like in the mediation but especially in the caucus because i don't want to call out anybody in the mediation discussion uh, i would do it in the caucus so does does that answer your question in part karen Oh, fabulous. I, yes. No, that was outstanding. Thank you very much. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. And also in peer mediation or in mediation, what I've seen is an increase in the mediation agreement that especially if there's going to be ongoing relationships and they know that, okay, the resolution of the issues have occurred, but the relationship issues haven't taken place, is that they'll put that people will seek conflict coaching as part of the mediation agreement. So I don't know if that's an, as a possibility or an option, but they could seek and, you know, go to three coaching sessions or something. So that would be another way to build in um, a stream, if you will, to conflict coaches as part of the mediation, especially if it's an ongoing issue. So that's something to think about too. Okay, so I have about uh, 12 minutes left. What I'd like to do is go to the next slide here and just talk a little bit about the coaching model. And every time I uh, forward, I have to get out of the, uh, mic the, the PowerPoint. So here we are in the seven stage coaching model that I use and Cindy uses. 
So the first is, is what is the conflict coaching goal? Now, the conflict coaching goal can be anything. I mean, can be anything they want it to be as long as it's about them and something they have control over. Sometimes people come in and, you know, I want to figure out how I can resolve this with so-and-so. A lot of times, it's not that at all. A lot of times they come in as, I just want to understand what happened. I just want to have someone to tell me, you know, to kind of think through what did I do or what just happened? I don't know why it came to this point. Or um, the coaching goal is I need to have a conversation with them and I don't even know how to have the conversation without blowing up. So their coaching goal is a lot of times about understanding, preparing for a conversation. Uh, and a lot of times they might start out with, I want to have a conversation. But once we go through the coaching process, they're like, nope, nope, I do not want to have a conversation. Nothing's going to change. I need to change how I think about that person and I need to change how I engage with them because I know they're not going to change and a conversation can actually make it worse. So they might come to a revelation that their goal is changing. So be very, very open to the coaching goal. They then get to go through their story. You know, what is the interpersonal conflict situation about and who is it with? I get people in there who've been in conflict with an individual for years and I'm like, okay, and they're like, well, let me start from the beginning. Well, that could be a very long session. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's uh, over a six month period. And what we're trying to do is get them to focus on what is one of the, of all the you know, incidents that you share, these interchanges you shared, what is the one that bothers you the most that's going to help you reach your goal? And that's how you get them focused so they're just not ranting and raving for hours and hours. Then we get into what we call a deconstruct. We work, walk through the not so merry-go-round construct. And, and one of the biggest elements in the deconstruct is to help them identify what is it the other person said or did or did not say or do that triggered them. So one, we're helping them to identify what was that specific point in time and very specifically, what did they say? What did they do? Was it an attitude? Was it a tone? Was it the raise of the eyebrow? Or was it something you expected them to do and they didn't? They didn't say good morning to you, whatever it is, but they expected something to happen and it didn't and that triggered them. And then what we do is we explore the trigger. Okay, so what is beneath that? And what we're looking at here is values, needs, and identity. So when people get defensive, we were talking about, Michael, when you were bringing about defensiveness, what are they protecting? They're usually protecting either some part of their identity that was challenged by the other person, you know, their identity as the best friend, the identity as a great teacher or a leader or a wife, a spouse, uh, whatever, whatever their identity is. And then some of their core values around trust or honesty, respect, being liked, uh, you know, being acknowledged. Um, if they don't feel that uh, they're getting those things from that person, it's triggering those things that they hold dear to their identity, their value, or their need. And so we really deconstruct around that. And then we also look at, you know, how did that impact your body language when that happened? What did you say to yourself about the other person? So we do a lot of exploration around assumptions and challenging those assumptions. We look at boundaries. We look at um, what is their own external reaction when they were triggered? How did they show up? And oftentimes people will show up in ways they don't want to show up. They're yelling, they're shouting, they shut down and they're like, I'm, and so we're asking, how did you, how would you prefer to be more effective? How would you prefer to be more constructive? And, and that usually gets tied to the goal. And then we look at consequences. And then we do it all over again from the other person's perspective. So mutuality really begins in the, in the deconstruct of that conflict situation. Then we go on into goal reassessment. And usually when we go through the deconstruct from both perspectives, either the person will now firmly agree that their goal is exactly the same or they give some clarity or they're like, oh my gosh, they have such a revelation, not only about themselves, but about the other person, then they're like, oh my gosh, I know exactly what I need to do. Here's my new goal. So it's not unusual for the goal to change because now they have another way of thinking about the situation. And then if they so choose, then we, we look at options. So what are your options for moving forward that's going to meet that goal? 
And a lot of times people want to what we call reconstruct, which is we're looking at how do we put it all together and practice. And this is where we rehearse and or maybe it's rehearsing a conversation, maybe it's rehearsing a new behavior, a new way of speaking. And, uh, and so we prepare them. And this is where the coach does the most in giving feedback during the practice sessions, and also the way for us to trigger them again, so that they can practice their new skill when they're triggered in real time. So it's it can be very challenging for them. But it's also extremely revealing and, and very empowering that they can and think about things differently or change their behaviors or even give very hard messages that they're so afraid to give because of how they think the other person will see them if they deliver whatever that important message is to that person. Um, so we help them with all of that. And of course, we look at barriers, kind of goes back to that self-determination piece. You know, the, 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 the person says, well, I'm just, I know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to go, you know, tell them like it is and, you know, you know, kick their butt or whatever, you know, and then, so then we talk about, okay, so what are the consequences for that decision or lack of decision or what's going to get in your way of actually carrying out this action plan? And finally, uh, thank you, Caroline, for uh, participating. And finally, the last one on the coaching model is the commitment, which is how, how are we going to hold you accountable for these changes? and what tasks need to happen to take the next steps to reach your goal. This, this happens over several sessions, usually three sessions or so. Um, but uh, this is the basics of the structured coaching model that we use. So I'll open it again for questions as we start to wrap up in our uh, conversation. Any, anything else, Cindy, that you want to say as we close um, or questions that people have? And I know you were recording this too. So Yeah, absolutely. Well, Patty, would you like to tell them about your conflict coaching um, course? Can you give a little information? Yes, I'll do that right now. So you'll see on the slide here that uh, we do do the Synergy Conflict Coaching as a virtual training and have for a while now. We actually have one that starts next week and I already have people from Israel, Sweden, and U.S., uh, two, two different states in the U.S. It is an 11 to 2 p.m. Central. It's over seven weeks. It's 26 hours of uh, International Coach Federation CE credit or 20 and 24 hours of SHRM credit. We also have option two, which happens uh, in April. Um, I think it's April, I forgot to put the actual date there. I believe it's April 12th to May 24th. And it's an evening course, 5.30 to 8.30. And you can find all the specifics to these two courses, but you would get the basic Synergy Conflict Coaching Certificate. Um, and then we would, you would also get these credits. So just go to conflictconnections.com. You'll see the website there on the left hand, bottom left hand corner to get all the details uh, or simply email me uh, if you're interested. Excellent. Well, Pat, um, Patty, before we go, um, I do want to, if you could stop sharing for a minute, I do want to share about two additional webinars that we have coming up um, for our for our viewers tonight so that way that they know that we do free webinars every month. Um, so I don't know how many of you have peer mediation programs, but there's actually our, um, the organization that sponsors the online peer mediation platform, which is called the National Association for Peer Program Professionals. We'll be hosting a webinar on February the 26th at 6 p.m. about how to recognize your peer mediators. And it give, we're going to um, give you a free kit, talk about, you know, different programs, like if you do a tutoring program, mentoring program, how you can actually recon, rec, um, recognize your students and your program and get more students interested. And that week of um, National Peer Helping Week is actually March 19th through the 23rd. And then our March webinar, um, which I went ahead and posted as well, is on restorative practices. And we are just tickled to have Vicki Shope from Fairfax County Schools. And that webinar will be March 21st at 6 p.m. And again, all these are free. Um, registration is actually on the OPMP site under events. Um, and also on our Facebook page. So I just want to put that out there before we ended. But um, before we end, does anyone have any questions for Patty or questions um, for us on OPMP? And, you could, and if not, you can always um, email Patty. I'm sure she will um, provide um, before we leave that uh, her, her um, information. So that way, when you get this video, you can contact her, her and we'll also provide our information as well. Oh, Patty, can't hear you. 
Let's see what happened here. Hmm. That is really weird. So, oh my goodness. Well, Patty has provided um, her her email to everyone. I'm also going to provide the online peer mediation platform so that you guys can contact us. Um, there we go. So I've provided that. And we just really appreciate you being on tonight. And um, so we're at 7 o'clock. And if you wish to stay, please stay on and ask some questions. If not, thank you so much for being on. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Cindy. Thank oh. you. <laughs> thank you.